Namaste, Pushandid, Sachi Akal, and welcome to the 2017 Indo American Community Lecture in India Studies. My name is Dr. Munis Faruqi. I'm the director of the Institute for South Asia Studies. I also am a member in the Department of South and Southeast Asian Studies here at UC Berkeley. The Institute for South Asia Studies hosts five fully endowed lecture series every year. The Indo-American Community Series is one of them, and also, if I have my facts correct, the oldest. Allow me to share some history with you. Back in 1990, 1991, when I was young and still had a full head of hair, the then CG of India in San Francisco, the Honorable Satinder Lamba, and our very own Professor Bob Goldman, seated here in the front, who was at the time the director of the Center for South Asia Studies, recognized that UC Berkeley needed a platform from which to provide thoughtful and critical conversations about India. The answer was to create a lecture series. But there was one catch. Then, as now, the university was thrilled by the idea and fully supportive, but unable to offer any funds to make it a reality. And so Ambassador Lamba and Professor Goldman did something quite unique in the history of the center up to that point. And you can see how much times have changed since then. They reached out to the Indian American community and other supporters to help create an endowed lecture series. Hundreds of individuals gave. Some gave in the tens, some gave in the thousands. But in the end, the collective generosity of the many not only yielded today's lecture series, but also more importantly, the community part of its name. Over the decades, and now in our third decade, the rewards have been, and I'm gonna use a word I rarely use, <coughs> that seems appropriate for uh, today's conversation, the rewards have been huge. <laughs> <laughs> for students and faculty at UC Berkeley, the larger Bay Area community, and now increasingly the world, because all our talks are uh, taped and put online, it has meant exposure to some of the most illustrious and thoughtful scholars of India. Among others, this has included Amita Bhavaskar, Upendra Bakshi, Andre Batiel, Madhav Gargil, Ramchandra Guha, Anuradha Kapoor, Pratap Banu Mehta, Nivda Tamilan, Menakshi Mukherjee, Ashish Nandi, Narendra Panjwani, and Ramla Thapar. And today we add Nandini Sundar to that list. But the benefits have also accrued to the Institute for South Asia Studies, as well as enabling it to play a role, a small role, in promoting interesting conversations on India. The Indo-American Community Lecture has allowed the Institute to develop deep and sustained ties with the larger Indian Amer American community. The value of these ties cannot be underestimated, especially in today's environment when, more than ever, we need reasoned, critical, and sustained conversations about where we are, how we got here, and how to move forward. Against this backdrop, let's remind ourselves of what a precious gift this Indo-American lecture series is to the world, in which difficult research, innovative ideas, and reasoned arguments are still appreciated. Which brings me almost to finishing. Although it is not my privilege to introduce the remarkable Professor Nandini Sundar, I'm thrilled to say a few words about the person who will be her interlocutor <coughs> tonight, Professor Raka Ray. Professor Ray is a member of three departments at UC Berkeley, namely Sociology, South and Southeast Asian Studies, and Geography. Professor Ray's interests are best exemplified in such exemplary books and influential ones as well, as fields of protest which focused on the intersection of women's movements and political fields in Kolkata and Mumbai, as well as Cultures of Servitude, co-authored with Simi Payum, which examined how class and gendered inequality gets produced and reproduced on a daily basis within the private world of the household. Beyond these two books and three other edited volumes, Professor Ray has written dozens of articles, trained 26 graduate students, mentored junior faculty such as myself, and also been a director for the Center for South Asia Studies. Truly, these achievements do not even come close to capturing the impact of Professor Ray on her field, UC Berkeley, or the larger South Asia-related intellectual ecosystem. I'm honored to call Professor Ray 
both a deeply respected colleague and a dear friend. Professor. I told him he spends more than 10 seconds introducing me. I will never, never, never introduce anybody again. <laughs> he has gone far beyond. So, um, sociologist Michael Bourvoy once analyzed the world of US sociology as divided between those who are professional sociologists who write for other sociologists, public sociologists, those who take their problems and topics of research from the world outside and who feel accountable to the world outside, policy-oriented sociologists whose work directly engages policy and who, um, who are involved in policy making, and those who are critical sociologists who take a sort of critical stance um, uh, about sort of sociological knowledge production. Nandini Sundar is that rare mixture who epitomizes all four. Educated at Oxford and Columbia Universities, Nandini Sundar is a social anthropologist who has been studying the tribal dominated district of Bastar in central India since the 1990s, before it became ground zero for civil war between Maoists and tribals who fought to protect the land against mining interests and a hyper-militarized state. She is the author of Subaltern, Subalterns and Sovereigns, an Anthropological History of Bastar, also published in Hindi, branching out joint forest management in India. She's co-editor of Anthropology in the East and several other books, um, and well, as well as many, many articles in both journals and in popular media. She's a former co-editor of India's premier journal of sociology, Contributions to Indian Sociology, former head of the Department of Sociology and former dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences at Delhi University. Her latest <coughs> book, the very readable and the very painful to read, um, The Burning Forest, India's War in Bastar, <coughs> is a searing indictment of the effects of this decade-long conflict on the Adivasi people of Bastar. Uh, Nandri Sundar received the Infosys Prize for the Best Social Scientist in, uh, in India in 2010. And I'm just going to read sort of one excerpt um, from that. It says, Professor Nandini Sundar is an outstanding <coughs> social anthropologist of South Asia who has made major and original contributions to our understanding of, envi of environmental struggles, of the impact of central and state policies on tribal politics, and of the moral ambiguities associated with subaltern political movements in contemporary India. Nandini has been a member of, and here's the uh, policy bit, she's been a member of several uh, government committees concerning the welfare of, of uh, scheduled tribes, such as the Working Group on Empowerment of Scheduled Tribes, the Planning Commission of Government of India, as well as a Working Group on Decentralized Planning and Panchayati Raj Institutions, um, also with the Planning <coughs> Commission, and there are several other groups, that, uh, sort of these sorts of policy uh, initiatives, but I'm not going to name them all. In the meantime, she has tried to hold the government accountable for its violations of law and human rights, filing public interest litigation in Indian courts about the use of vigilantism, killings, rapes, and arson <coughs> in Dantewada district of Chhattisgarh. In 2011, following a writ petition filed by her, the Supreme Court described finally as illegal and unconstitutional the deployment of tribal youth as sort of vigilante special police officers in the fight against uh, Naxal or Maoist insurgency. That ruling strongly indicted the state government for violating constitutional principles in arming youth who were school dropouts and conferring on them the power of justice. When, in 2016, the Central Bureau of Investigation filed charges against special police officers and vigilante group leaders for their role in the burning of three villages in Sukma district in March 2011, based on the investigative work of Nandini and others, the police, the police not only burnt effigies of Nandini Sundar and other activists, but they basically uh, filed an FIR uh, naming her as co-conspirator in the murder of a tribal called uh, Shamnath Baghel, a tribal in that same district. So this charge was later dropped. And in fact, the National Human Rights Commission called out the um, IGP of Bastar Range, S SRP Kaluri, and the Chhattisgarh Chief Secretary for vindictive action and gross abuse of power. But there has been no secession of violence, impunity, and exploitation in Bastar. In the burning forest, Nandini writes, she warns, 
future historians will note the passing of a civilization that understood the forest, and the rise of a society of middlemen, contractors, param paramilitary force, and of divisions induced by religious and political parties. But in the end, in her epilogue, she gives us access to her dream. And I'm going to read out just some excerpts from that dream. She writes, in the novel Atonement, the protagonist cannot endure the unbearable sadness of what actually happened. So she decides to write an alternative, happy ending. Like her, in my other story, I see the forested hills of Bastar around me, with no sign of a, military, of a para paramilitary camp. The jungle has grown over to cover the scars. Following a change in government, there was an accord, and all those responsible for mass crimes were put in jail. A new constitution gave all people the right to decide how they wanted their resources to be used. All the royalties from the existing Belidila mines, uh, mine, mines and the profits from the steel plant at Nagarnar went to an elected council, managed, among others, by village elders and former Adivasi guerrillas. They used it to level fields and build ponds, schools, hospitals, etc. Everything else, the villagers decided, would be left as forest. Primary healthcare centers started working in every panchayat, and children were no longer pot-bellied with, ha with hunger. No one was landless. No one migrated for labor. In my narrative, she writes, I walk through dense and fragrant forests, and I can hear the koel calling. Schools teach, Gondi, schools teach in Gondi, Dhurwa, Hindi, and English, with options to learn Spanish, Arabic, or Chinese. <laughs> Once they grow up, some of the children become novelists, lawyers, politicians, and scientists, using their knowledge of the forest to create life-saving drugs. But they always come home for the village Mandai to worship their hill gods. My story dances with abandon, to the sound of the Madhya Dhol, and under a full moon night, where my friends and I raise a toast of Mahua to hope and the future. In the end then, Nandini Sundar, 4 four sociologist, an indefatigable activist, has faith. And we have faith in her. It is my very great pleasure to introduce Nandini Sundar. Gosh, thanks, Raka, for that enormously generous introduction. And um, I should have said I wouldn't speak if you were going to. <laughs> 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 so next time I know. Um, uh, yes, the 10 second rule. <laughs> and I'm really grateful to the Institute for South Asian Studies and the Indo-American community um, uh, lectureship for uh, inviting me here. It's been one of the best weeks of my life. It's been truly an honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, so, talk for about 40, 40 minutes. Yeah. Um, so, my talk today is really, uh, as it's as you know, it's called Hostages to Democracy, and it's about the kind of conundrums that um, one faces on an everyday level, uh, on an everyday basis, with the forms and practices of democracy and the impossibility of both any non-democratic opposition, but at the same time, the impossibility of having much redress within the forms of democracy that exist. Um, <coughs> And I start with a particular incident which for me exemplifies what it means to be a kind of hostage to this, to the forms of democracy that we have. Earlier this year, um, in May, um, a very close friend of mine was picked up, who's a human rights activist, um, the elected, was the elected leader of his village, was picked up from near his home and um, Know, taken away by the police and uh, who refused to tell his family where he was and so on. Uh, his wife filed a habeas corpus petition for him in the High Court. Uh, he was then produced in the High Court under heavy police presence and as we later learned had been tortured for days, uh, hung upside down, shot blindfolded, shot on both sides. And he said in court that he had surrendered and had gone to the police out of his own 
volition. Uh, some months on, he is still in indefinite police custody, and in a sense, all, wherever he is allowed to sort of move around the town, but wherever he goes, he's taken with police uh, presence. And he has not formally surrendered, but he has not not surrendered, because now, after having been portrayed as a collaborationist, paraded around his neighborhood by the police as someone who has surrendered, his life would be unsafe if he left. So he is nowhere um, like all the other surrenderees do. Um, so hundreds of villages, villagers across central India, whether in Charkand or in Odisha or in Chhattisgarh, are being picked up and shown as having surrendered, including some 400 youth in Charkand who were promised that if they paraded with arms, they were given old guns and told that if they paraded with arms, they would be shown, they would be given jobs in the CRPF because that's one of the benefits of being a surrendery that you get uh, jobs. So they actually paid a lakh uh, and lots of other money, to, you know, a lakh each and etc. to surrender or to be shown as surrender. So state surrenders help the police to avoid uh, opprobrium for mass arrest because that in effect is what they are, to fudge the rehabilitation money offered under the state surrender policy, to adapt, to adopt carrot and stick policies with villagers to induce compliance and to divide insurgent village communities. So if surrenders are the seemingly benign face of counterinsurgency, democracy plays the same role at a larger level where the choice exercised in an election is used to delegitimize other kinds of non-electoral choices, including which political party or ideology to support and how to live. Um, so today I examine the aporias of democracy, drawing on Derrida's notions of uh, ideas of aporias of justice. For Derrida, legal indeterminacy constitutes the aporitic aspect of justice, that once a case is decided, it either revalidates the existing rules or establishes a new, a new rule. But at that moment of deciding or delivering justice, it is neither just nor unjust. Going further back, just as law in its founding moment is neither legal nor illegal for Derrida, democracy in its founding moment is neither democratic nor undemocratic especially insofar as it also founds those in whose name it rules, just as constitutions found the citizens in whose name uh, they are enacted. It is in moments when it claims to represent the rule that the political system most imposes its authority on the ruled, reconfiguring those consenting, the process of consent, and the outcome of, of consent. So, Again, uh, so this whole paper is sort of written in the backdrop of this ongoing civil war in Bastar, where, um, as Raka said, over the last 10 years, there has been um, a concerted form of counterinsurgency. Uh, and just for those of you uh, who, who might need it, uh, just a little background on the area. So this is a very rich, mineral-rich, uh, mm -hmm. densely forested area, predominantly inhabited by Adivasis. Um, and the Maoists came in here in the early 1980s where uh, they basically helped the villagers to drive away the local bureaucracy, recolonize forest land. Um, and in many cases, and they also took up issues like bigamy, domestic violence, which you know attracted a lot of women, uh, Kader, et cetera. In many cases, the pressure to act came from villagers themselves and was not the imposition of some Maoist ideology. At the same time, because any kind of, and they effectively became what is almost a parallel state, and because parallels, because statehood involves some form of coercion, inevitably there has been a, a large amount of coercion as well. But over the decades, they've established their own structures of governance, which are village collectives called sangams, um, which were both embryonic forms of village democracy and yet closely connected to the Maoist party apparatus. Um, over the last 10 years or so, in the course of counterinsurgency, the government has been successful in portraying the Maoists as terrorists. Traditionally, however, the establishment tended to rec uh, regard the Naxalites as merely misguided with the right cause but the wrong strategy. A common argument made by mainstream politicians and Gandhian activists is that Indian democracy, and this is really the kind of what I'm setting up my argument against, 
is that Indian democracy provides enough opportunity for political voice, that Adivasis do not need to engage in armed struggle to get their demands heard, that Maoists are imposing their militarist ideology on Adivasis and are against democracy. So for instance, uh, a month ago, uh, Yogendra Yadav, the well-known political scientist and activist, um, tweeted uh, an article uh, which talked about the decline of the Maoists, saying, Welcome news as CPI Maoist opposed to democracy and Indian state. Time to address poverty that gave rise to Maoists, unquote. So what this article actually explores is, not, is uh, not only the way in which democracy as currently practiced is not enough of an alternative to armed struggle, but actually acts as an instrument of counterinsurgency, in particular two aspects that are seen as essential to democracy, one, elections, and second, the responsibility for providing welfare and employment. Um, so there's a whole debate about Indian democracy and how good it is, how <coughs> bad it is. Um, and in the dominant mainstream political discourse, um, Indian democracy is unique among its neighbors. So people are always pointing to Pakistan and its military um, regimes. Uh, people, commenters, data, celebrate universal suffrage, federalism, the subordination of the army to civilian rule, an independent judiciary, and a broadly welfare-oriented economic regime. Internal critics of democracy, on the other hand, point to emergency laws like the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, the frequent extrajudicial killings, torture, custodial um, rapes, disappearances, especially but not only one must emphasize in conflict areas, apart from organized massacres in which members of the ruling party have played a leading role as in Delhi 1984 and Gujarat 2002. So this dichotomy in certifying whether a particular state is a democracy is, of course, not peculiar to India. And as Julia Paley notes, that, and I quote, the discourses labeling certain regimes as democracies are strategically deployed by groups with strong interests in particular definitions and contested by others differently situated in relations of power, unquote. So while democracy has several meanings, the most common association is with elections. And um, on the <coughs> other hand, Political scientists have pointed out that elections are often held in authoritarian regimes as well. And if one wants to distinguish democracy uh, from mere electoralism, um, one needs to associate substantive democracy with a basket of elements. Electoral choice, of course, but also a separation of powers, uh, rule of law, freedom of speech, popular participation in governments, and protection for minorities. In both uh, Brazil and South Africa, uh, a survey done by the South Asia uh, Survey for Democracy, um, survey, res survey respondents identified democracy with the system's ability to meet basic social and economic needs rather than predominantly procedural features. Um, and so there's been a lot of work on democracy. So for instance, people like Ram Chandra Goha um, or Ashutosh Varshni arguing that Indian democracy must be awarded a 50% pass mark, um, mm -hmm. or that the battle is half won, as Varshni puts it. And Others, some people like Neja Jayal arguing that India does better on procedural than on substantive democracy, while uh, others arguing that the hope for change lies in uh, subaltern struggles and so on. So you know, there's a whole range of political science writing on democracy in India. The problem that I attempt to address here, however, is not just the imperfect realization of democratic ideals, which as um, Marshall pointed out, is always undoubtedly work in progress, or even Derrida's <coughs> idea of democracy to come. Instead, the conundrum that I focus on is the state's ability to deploy democracy, both procedural democracy and a limited conception of substantive democracy as a weapon against dissenters. The problem arises when, as Raymond William puts it, the idea of democracy as popular power, which is the socialist tradition, or democracy as electoral representation, the liberal tradition, confront each other as enemies. Freedom of speech, for instance, may be dismissed as bourgeois democracy, uh, while an attempt to exercise popular power in the popular interest, for instance, by a general strike, uh, is and this is again from Williams, is described as anti-democratic, since, demo since democracy has already been assured by other means. Since 2014, um, the slow infiltration and subversion of all democratic institutions, the judiciary, the media, the army, by uh, right-wing uh, elements, with the long-term agenda of establishing a Hindu nation has raised even more serious questions about the ease with which Indian democracy can be subverted 
and even converted into semi-fascism <coughs> using an electoral majority. And this is the argument that Ejaz Ahmed has been making about electoral avenues towards uh, old fascism or semi-fascism. The issue is not just minorities, including Adivasis, being held hostage to a majoritarian electoral democracy, but a more fundamental question that relates to how democracy crafts its majorities. The quiet acquiescence to and even celebration of demonetization, um, which deprive the public at large of property in the form of their own money, is perhaps the best example of this. Um, and as William Wright puts it in a book that seems uncannily as if it could have been written for India today, uh, the mass psychology of fascism. Mm -hmm. And the question that he asks is, what was it in the masses that counts, that caused them to follow a party, the aims of which were objectively and subjectively strictly at variance with their own interests? Mm -hmm. And one can multiply the examples, 71% of India being non-vegetarian, but yet no mass protest at the imposition of meat bans uh, or um, a whole range or um, I mean, there are several things that one could point to. Lederberg puts it in another way, invoking the power of the spectacular, and I quote, the more readily he recognizes his own needs in the image of need proposed by the dominant system, the less he understands his own existence and his own desires, unquote. Given the centrality of mediatized messaging which passes for politics um, in India and elsewhere, uh, this is an important area to explore, but beyond the scope of this paper. Uh, my aim here is something much cruder, uh, to see how democracy works as an element of counterinsurgency and an element of violence. Now, violence is something that poses a special problem for democracy to the extent that democratic states are assumed to rest on the consent of the governed, and democracy is seen as a means to resolve and reconcile differences in a non-violent manner. There's a dominant stream of work within liberal political science, the whole literature on failed states, civil wars, which sees violence as antithetical to democracy, looking at states with high degrees of violence, whether in the form of civil wars or vigilante mafias, urban gangs, and so on, as still transitional to some ideal democracy found in the developed West. In the encounter between ethnically and religious heterogeneous communities, usually located in the second and third world, quote unquote, with supposedly universalist first world state forms like democracy. It is the unruliness of the former, the ethnicities, the religious differences which are seen as creating problems. What is often ignored is the historically complex way in which communities have lived together and that it is not the fact of ethnicity per se, but the way that it is mobilized which is the problem. A more critical approach argues that high levels of inequality in society may make violence a necessary part of a democratic argument in the form of strikes or protests. So in this understanding, the Maoists are really extending democracy rather than challenging it or opposing it, since almost all their demands for Adivasi rights to land and forest resources are already guaranteed by the Constitution, even if not implemented in practice. So even as violent protests may be suppressed, it forces change on the state by making it accede to similar demands by parallel non-violent groups. And the best example of this, perhaps, is the 2006 Forest Rights Act, which uh, very self-consciously was passed against the backdrop of uh, Maoist violence in order to wean Adivasis away from Maoists or to undercut the Maoist appeal. Yet others like uh, Arias and Goldstein have pointed the ways in which neoliberal democracy with its focus on individuals and procedure at the expense of egalitarian and participatory democracy has engendered vigilantism since citizens are increasingly responsible for their own security. Arguing for the concept of violent pluralism where the state does not have a monopoly over violence, they point to the need to understand new political orders and new political subjectivities in situations where multiple violent actors interact. This is indeed important to understand how people live under the dual sovereignties of the Maoist state and the Indian state, or for that <coughs> matter, the parallel states that function all over India, from Kashmir to Nagaland to the Hindu Rashtra or the communalized and ghettoized state of Gujarat, which is actually a parallel state of its own. My focus, however, is not on the relationship between violence and civil society, either between different groups or between civil society versus the state, and uh, on the relationship between this kind of violence or democratic change and or democratic outcomes. Instead, my theme is how the structures and processes of formal democracy enable state violence. Now, there's a long theoretical history to um, 
the intrinsic relationship between states, not just democracy, but the very existence of a state and violence starting with Hobbes and um, Weber's idea of you know states being defined as a monopoly of violence or Benjamin's distinction between law preserving and law enabling, uh, law making and law preserving violence. Uh, but this paper is again not so much about this kind of foundational violence of statehood in general, but about the particular ways in which democracy is actively deployed as an uh, instrument of violence and counterinsurgency. And before I kind of get into the examples of that from Bastet, I want to clear away the argument that democracy makes a difference to the way that state violence is deployed in the context of counterinsurgency, which again is another one of those issues that has been studied within the political science literature, uh, with some people arguing that democratic regime types matter to the existence and conduct of counterinsurgency because they're less likely to create uh, or to spawn internal insurgencies, that when these do arise, that democracies are better at dealing with them due to the pressure of public opinion, or that democratic states are more likely to take a balanced or moderate approach, uh, co you know, combining counterinsurgency and killing with welfareism. Other scholars contest this claim, arguing that there's no empirical evidence when comparing regime types that democracies handle counterinsurgencies any differently from more authoritarian regimes. So failing across national comparison, a historical comparison with the tropes of colonial counterinsurgency would suggest that democracy appears to make little difference. So quoting Mao on the antonyms used to describe the Hunan uprising, uprising of 1927, uh, Ranajit Guha draws up the structural oppositions and official versus peasant characterizations of uh, insurgency during colonialism. And he writes about how insurgent is opposed to peasant, fanatic to Islamic Puritan, defying the authority of the state to revolt against Zamindari, disturbing the public tranquility, which is the way that the colonial state described it to struggles for a better order. And we might as well have been talking of contemporary India, where Naxalite terrorists, quote unquote, are opposed to CRPF martyrs, or where inhuman Maoists are opposed, in the Mao's discourse, on the other hand, to heroic PLGA guerrillas. Now, Indian security experts acknowledge, uh, if you look at a lot of the literature, um, there is a fair sense that there is a set pattern to the way that Indian the, the, the Indian state handles counterinsurgency. So political and administrative failure and misgovernance leads to ethnic, religious, or class mobilization. The government sets up various commissions to look into these grievances, but does not act on any of their recommendations. When people take to armed struggle in desperation, the government responds by bringing in paramilitary forces, and if those fail, the army. Um, special legislation like AFSPA is enacted, civilian casualties go up, leading to greater support for the insurgents. The state rides it out over several decades since it has time and resources on its side as compared to the insurgents and in the meantime co-opts local elites and when the finally the insurgency is practically finished may come up with some kind of political solution like a peace accord. And we've seen this especially in Mizoram where you know over several decades um, people were just tired into uh, and there was a lot of other stuff going on the church mediating and so on. But in all of this, insurgency is reduced to crime rather than seen as a political grievance that can be met with democratically. A tradition, as Nasser Hussein argues, that dates from the colonial state which blurred policing with counterinsurgency. Um, and as Hussein argues, contemporary, uh, or argued, contemporary American coin um, ignores the fact, counterinsurgency ignores the fact that many of the measures the British used and which are adopted today were possible only because the British were using them already in everyday administration. So in any case, whether inherited from a common colonial past or not, counterinsurgency styles across the world today, whether in democracies or military regimes, draw on a common pattern of military training, counterinsurgency manuals, and so on. So Indian counterinsurgency draws very heavily from um, the Malayan experience, but it's quite interesting that that was also happening in real time. So while the official narrative is that it was drawing from Malaysia and Vietnam, actually it was being practiced in India uh, during the Telangana armed struggle of 1946 to 48 as well. So you know, in a sense, one doesn't know where, because it goes equally from one element of the colonies elsewhere. So while democracy makes less of a difference when it comes to counterinsurgency than one might think, um, in the rest of my paper, is 
I'm trying to offer a thesis about how the formal structures of Indian democracy work positively to facilitate counterinsurgency and thus work against a more substantive outcome. So the first three arguments are in the context of welfare, and the second three arguments are in the context of elections. And the last two arguments uh, that I offer are in the context of accountability. Of course, um, democracy, I mean, especially constitutional democracy, enables dissenting groups to invoke foundi foundational charters. And in this case, uh, that's the Indian constitution. And even as the state attempts to uh, monopolize the discourse on democracy, there are also spaces through which alternative voices can emerge. And this is not in any way meant to dismiss uh, elections. And there are very few events in India which equal the excitement of elections. Um, and there is serious investment in voting. So I'm not in any sense trying to deny the real possibility and promise of democracy as it might be, um, or as it is in some areas, in some contexts. Uh, but also to try and point to the ways in which the very existence of this democracy <coughs> is a mechanism for unprecedented doc domination. So first, um, I look at welfare as an instrument of counterinsurgency. Now, the first argument that I'm making is that the welfare policies for scheduled tribes um, actually divert from a critical examination of the laws that now some of the arguments that I'm making are relatively uncontested. Many of them are not unique to India. But one is that the law, I mean, there are huge numbers of welfare provisions for both scheduled castes and scheduled tribes, articles for reservation, Article 15, um, as well as special provisions for forms of alternative governance, the fifth schedule, the sixth schedule, um, the setting up of, uh, you know, the ministry for scheduled tribes, uh, a motor ministry of tribal affairs, uh, the national commission for scheduled castes, the national commission for scheduled tribes. There's a huge range of protective legislation. But all of this is actually worth nothing when you look at the fundamental laws that govern the lives of Adivasis, uh, both in central India and in the Northeast, AFSPA in the Northeast. But across the country, laws to do with um, land, the Land Acquisition Act, the various associated acts like the Coal Bearing Areas Act, the Indian Penal Code, and the Indian Forest Act. And without. Um, And while the protective legislation is very rarely enforced, uh, it is these laws which um, continue to be used to criminalize Adivasis and to displace them. One in every four persons who has been displaced in India since 1947 is an Adivasi, and given and some of them have been displaced multiple times. And if one looks at prison populations, and again, this is common with um, the situation of um, other minorities, Muslims, Adivasis, and Dalits in India are the best represented in prison populations nationwide. While in states affected by counterinsurgency, such as Chhattisgarh, the prisons are overflowing, and the only way that the government is thinking of dealing with this problem is to build new prisons. So unless these fundamental laws and the bureaucratic frameworks that support them are frontally challenged, uh, it's pretty pointless, in fact, to have this whole range of uh, specific welfare legislation. Second, the, how democracy works in India is an example of a more general problem of how modern states work in drawing marginal populations into their regimes, reducing democracy to a question of numbers and beneficiaries. Uh, in delivering services, as we know, you know, people like James Scott and others have been writing about this for a long time. Uh, in delivering services, the state regulates bodies, forcing people to move away from small scattered habitations to urban centers. In providing education, it devalues certain kinds of life in favor of others, giving people a Hobson's choice between democratic incorporation and destitution. So um, in India, ignoring the promise held out by the constitution of a different governance structure which could accommodate the unique needs of Adivasi populations, successive governments have claimed that they can only provide basic goods to the Adivasi populations in conflict-affected areas. One, if they cut off their ties with the insurgents, whether it was the MNF in the 60s, the Mizo National Front, or the Maoists today. And second, if they change their lifestyle completely and stop living in the forest. So for instance, um, talking about the Integrated Action Plan, which was launched in 2010 to, along with the paramilitary combing operations, 
Uh, the then Home Minister Chidambaram is quoted as saying, and I and quote from an uh, article in the Hindu, they must know that the government is friendly to their way of life, but wants to help them change their way of life. <laughs> and the current regime has only made this process, um, has only intensified this process. Uh, the third argument about uh, democracy being used as an element of counterinsurgency is in the, con in the context of welfare, is the way in which employment is increasingly, is both seen as part of the basic rationale of any modern democratic state, but the kind of employment being offered increasingly um, presents indigenous youth with a dilemma. The only jobs available in many counterinsurgency affected areas are, and in fact across the country, are the, high, the maximum growth uh, in employment is taking place in the paramilitary forces and the police. Um, and whereas earlier, uh, so for instance, we saw that in the Salvajidom when um, youth were conscripted to act as special police officers and many joined because they thought they would get a government, uh, regular government job, not realizing that they were being used against their own people. Um, increasingly, even within the formal um, paramilitary forces, youth are increasingly being drawn from the areas where the counterinsurgency is happening. So as one newspaper report uh, made clear, and I quote, the ministry thinks it is important to recruit youngsters from these districts for the paramilitary forces like CRPF to wean them away from joining the Naxal fold, unquote. This emphasis on providing formal employment also works against Adivasis by presenting them with a dilemma between jobs and land. So on the one hand, um, there are increasing numbers of non-Adivasi immigrants who completely dominate the trade, dominate the bureaucracy, who all very much look to counterinsurgency as a way of uh, developing their areas. But even for Adivasi youth whose areas for whom development of these areas will basically mean displacement, uh, there is a serious dilemma in terms of whether or not to join these um, or how to engage with these large companies. And the promise of employment in a factory is often used to buy off protest against displacement, uh, even though only one member of a family that is losing um, land will be employed. One of um, the students in our department has just finished this wonderful thesis looking at the decline of the Kashipur movement, which was one of the strongest anti-mining movements. Um, Minati Dash looks at how, over a period of time, people became incorporated into working with the company, making demands from a position of pure res uh, resistance and not wanting the company to be there at all. And one sees this across the country with people both joining the paramilitary forces, working with companies, the kinds of dilemmas that this sets up within Adivasi communities. So to summarize this section, while the repertoire of counterinsurgency is common to different parts of the world, in central India it's been inflected with a particular character that draws on the nature of Indian democracy. The location of Adivasis is the poorest and most backward section of the Indian population, requiring to be weaned away from their forest-dependent lifestyles. The constellation of classes, especially the growing middle classes, which want economic growth at all costs, and the attractions of government employment as paramilitaries, uh, as a path to modernity for all youth, regardless of their ethnicity. So counterinsurgency, especially in order to clear the way for mining and industrialization, is justified nationwide and even to the communities who are being proceeded against as a massive employment exercise. Um, the next section is on elections as an instrument of counterinsurgency. And again, if you look at a lot of the political science literature on elections, uh, much of it has been focused on post-conflict areas, pointing to the ways in which elections um, contribute to peace building. So for instance, South Africa, El Salvador, Nepal are held out as successful examples. And on the other hand, we also know that Iraq, Afghanistan, Sri Lanka translate as examples where uh, elections do not automatically translate into democratic processes, especially when conducted under the ages of an occupying power or as a triumphalist victor in a civil war, as was the case in um, Sri Lanka. Or they may actually contribute to further conflict, as in Kenya. So unlike in these Indian other cases, Indian elections have always been held alongside conflict. A few, um, and this actually draws again from British um, Malayan emergency uh, instructions to keep civilian government going at all costs. So even if the government has only 
has control only over the small district headquarter. It is still there with all the paraphernalia of being a district administration um, and holding elections over the years. If you do get a chance, please watch this film, Newton, um, which is, uh, I think it's coming to San Francisco or has just come or whatever, and it's India's official entry to the Oscars. Uh, well, not official because the, the Oscar entry is not an official thing, but it's India's entry to the Oscars this year. But it really is about um, the holding of democracy, of elections in an area you know, where uh, it means many different things. And the relationship between democracy and elections in India is an extremely complex one. Um, in Kashmir, the anger was sort of exacerbated by the rigging of elections in 89. And across the country, there have been, you know, over the decades, associations between the spiking of small arms possession and elections, uh, and which is why you require the election commission to hold elections at different phases, precisely so that they can deploy uh, uh, paramilitary forces uh, across the country. But security forces are also used to ensure that people vote whether they want to or not. And in Kashmir, um, parts of Andhra Pradesh, this was this used to be historically a huge problem where people were forced to vote at gunpoint. And while that has come down with the nota option, um, in Kashmir recently, uh, separatist leaders were arrested for boycotting elections. And high voter turnouts in Maoist areas are extensively cheered <coughs> in the media with um, you know, people talking about um, whenever people do come to vote, regardless of the low turnouts in non-insurgency areas. In the 2013 assembly elections, there was one armed security personnel to every 19 residents in Bastar. And that number is likely to go up uh, in the coming 2018 elections. And the Maoists also treat elections as fair game, attacking security forces who are accompanying poll officers, uh, looting EVMs, and so on. So my fourth argument, then, in the context of elections is that elections are a precarious marker of democracy in times of counterinsurgency. And they sometimes act as an instrument, especially when forces deployed to get populations to vote uh, to make an already vulnerable prof uh, population even more fragile. The issue is, of course, also not just why individual parties win, but why electoral democracies fail to deliver on their promises. And among vulnerable and numerically small populations in particular, there are structural constraints to appropriate political leadership. Adivasi politicians, for one, are dependent on their parties for money to contest, unlike many of the other political uh, leaders who uh, contest, and also on businesses which are almost always controlled by non-Adivasi. So there is already in the act of standing for elections a structural <coughs> impediment to actually representing their own people in any meaningful sense. And unlike Dalits or uh, Electoral studies show that even in areas where they are dominant, uh, Adivasis do not vote uh, uniformly as a community. My fifth argument is that elections are used to delegitimize other forms of political participation. And one example of this is um, from a long struggle by some groups in Jharkhand to not have panchayat elections because they felt that it destroyed their own traditional forms of uh, their own traditional political structures, and that it would introduce party divisions among communities which had till then been fairly united. The Maoists have also argued, uh, again, have also boycotted local elections, arguing that this leads to corruption, uh, because uh, individuals then function as, the elected sarpanches function as agents of the state against a unified citizenry, because in practice, uh, the sarpanches are structurally bound to do things that the state does, and that usually involves bringing in money and then not actually spending it and being corrupt, etc. So their attempts to form alternative kinds of local democracies by through their sangams or their jantana sarkar is seen as anti-democratic by the state. And uh, in fact, in uh, Odisha in um, 2009, I think, uh, people who had been elected uh, to the in the panchayat elections were, the government actually didn't want to give those panchayats any money because they were seen as sympathetic to the Maoists. So even if the Maoists do want to enter 
through the electoral process, they are regarded then with suspicion and the government actually talks about stopping funding for them. My sixth argument is that bourgeois democracy, as Marx described it, and this is a very general argument, is always precarious. Um, and this is a more general argument about the basic tension between inequality and political voice and the fact that democracy is rendered even more precarious by the money required for elections. The media keeps reporting on the growing number of millionaire MPs who alone can afford the high rates of expenditure that campaigning involves, and uh, the phenomenon of paid news, um, et cetera, et cetera. And it was pointed out that the BJP has uh, spent almost as much in the 2014 elections on media advertising alone as Obama spent under all heads <coughs> in the 2012 presidential campaign. And um, there really is no accounting of, um, uh, because even if you look at, well, I won't get into that, but the Gujarat elections now, the kind of campaigning that is happening as part of official government trips. Mm -hmm. Anyways. So there is a strong relationship between um, electoral democracy and primitive accumulation or accumulation by dispossession. And in Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, etc., it's an open secret that mining leases are given in exchange for election funding. While the paying off of both media houses and individual journalists is routine in order to ensure favorable coverage for the government. But all of this, once elections happen, once you have a government, is just swept aside as something that is just not talked about when talking about the legitimacy of governments. So this is not to say that elections are merely bought. Uh, schemes like the two rupee rice scheme in Chhattisgarh or the Mitanin, which is the auxiliary health worker scheme, have been important, as well as the indoctrination and welfare work put in by the RSS through its fronts like the Ekal Vidyalay, Vanvasi Kalyan Ashram, etc. Tariq Tachil argues that the Congress has provided a look. In, his work is on electoral uh, electoralism in Chhattisgarh, and he looks at the way in which the Congress Party has been. Uh, providing very little opposition, being internally divided, and how its style of vertical patronage politics provides no match for the BJP's dense um, organizational presence on the ground through RSS France. But in the context of a Maoist boycott and with left parties like the CPI as real alternative, it is doubtful whether the BJP's organizational work alone or the government's welfare schemes would have worked if no extra money was deployed to influence the polls. So my last two arguments are about accountability um, and the way in which the other features of democracy, which is the separation of powers, um, the judiciary, again, through their failures, actually act as violent instruments of counterinsurgency. Um, for instance, um, I mean, especially statutory institutions and courts, both through their acts of omission and commission. For instance, most of the last decade, uh, the National Human Rights Commission has failed to respond to com uh, complaints of massive human rights violations in Chhattisgarh. Uh, and in 2008, its report whitewashing the atrocities of the Salvajadum has been extensively used by the government for propaganda purposes. And indeed, in many cases, um, Statutory institutions like the NHRC are designed not to function uh, with membership of these commissions um, as of other institutions across the country, both academic and statutory, uh, being seen as a sinecure for members of the ruling party and sympathizers. Even the Supreme Court is ignored when inconvenient, invoked when convenient, and uh, the kind of uh, ways in which uh, the fact of these institutions is used to silence um, and just brush aside uh, any hope of justice is quite remarkable. The eighth argument is that democracies are dangerous because they induce forgetting. And not only does every election hold out promise, but the seductions of new issues obliterates the institutional keeping alive of memory and account that accountability and in turn the possibility of future democracy demands. People are constantly being invited to forgive and forget when it is not theirs to forgive. Hmm. Elections are used as a way of evading judicial accountability with judges fearful of overstepping their boundaries while calling elected representatives to account. This was evident both in 84 uh, and in 2002 with the victories in elections being treated as exoneration and uh, judicial exoneration regardless of the fact that cases were going on in the courts. <coughs> 
Uh, in Chhattisgarh, despite the scale of human rights violations, the government has been able to harness the war, war on Maoists to its own advantage, partly through the media blackout of the rest of the state, and also partly to the, due to the fact that in areas where um, you have the most massive counterinsurgency operations, voting simply doesn't take place. So in his celebrated work comparing famine in India and China, Sen argued that while there may be chronic starvation in, in India, there could never be famine as in China, largely because of the checks and balances introduced by electoral democracy, the role of the opposition, and a free press. However, as Dan Bannock shows in his study of starvation deaths in Kalahandi, these features need to be unpacked further to show how the opposition and press really function. Given a range of features like an unmotivated bureaucracy, judicial interventions which cannot be enforced and are ignored by state governments, a highly vocal press that lacks credibility, um, fundamental similarities in approach between government and oppositions, and weak panchayats, these formal features of electoral democracy do not prevent chronic famine. Nor, one might safely add, does electoral democracy serve to prevent mass killings during counterinsurgencies or during pogroms, or to ensure accountability thereafter when peace has been ensured, or has been restored, peace unquote. So just to conclude, um, I've tried in this presentation today to unpack the nature of electoral democracy in India, especially as it functions in Adivasi areas, to show how precarious democratic institutions and procedures can be when the fundamental interests of the state are challenged, or capital, are challenged by insurgencies. And indeed, how democracy, as it is practiced, can be part of the problem rather than the solution to insurgency. Democracy functions in three ways in relationship to precarity and violence. It's a casualty of violence. It's an enabler of violence and precarity, including the slow violence of starvation, as well as, and it is important to emphasize, being a resource for oppressed groups. So just to um, kind of summarize and reiterate uh, the arguments, so um, I've looked at the relationship between democracy and counterinsurgency from several angles. First, arguing that democracy as practiced in India is not a sufficient force to delegitimize armed struggle, which brings different but essential benefits to those who participate in it. Second, that, in a, that yes, in an ideal world, there would be no armed struggle, but given the world not being ideal, there are reasons why people turn to these groups uh, for some kind of succor or some kind of countervailing force to the oppressions of the state. Second, there is little change in the ideology or pros of counterinsurgency from the colonial to the post-colonial period, indicating that democracy has made little difference to the prosecution of counterinsurgency. Third, that welfare aspirations are mobilized to deny Adivasis and other minority groups the right to political choice. Um, and we saw this also in the whole debate about Aadhaar, where the government actually made the argument in the Supreme Court that uh, people had no right to liberty because their Aadhaar was important for their welfare. So their welfare trumped their right to privacy, uh, notwithstanding the fact that it was welfare as defined by the government and privacy as. Yes. Um, so third, that welfare aspirations are mobilized to deny Adivasis and other minority groups the right to political choice. And in this context, formal employment serves as an instrument of dispossession. Fourth, that elections act as another form of counterinsurgency when people are forced to vote under heavy security presence. Sixth, that there is a close relationship between election financing and primitive accumulation. And finally, that electoral politics enable amnesias of accountability. The ruling parties and media promote elections as if they were justified opinion polls on whether mass crimes should be punished. And ultimately then elections are performative moments to entrench state legitimacy rather than mechanisms to reflect genuine consent. So there's been, again, a lot of work on how reasons of state, um, the deep nexus of bureaucracy and capital that maintain the state as a continuity from the colonial to the post-colonial period are strengthened rather than overturned by reasons of democracy. And this is part of that post-9-11 expanding work on um, you know, anti-terror laws and how um, they serve as justifications for collateral damage and wars on people. Mm -hmm. But what is more Worrying is the extent to which democracy uh, reconfigures the people themselves. Mm 
Ranaveer Samadar has argued that this tendency is especially visible in post-colonial societies like India with their legacy of authoritarian laws meant to control the natives. Colonial, and I quote from him, colonial constitutionalism oscillates between a Rousseauistic consent governed theme where the state represents the will of the people and the spirit of constitutional engineering that meant elaborating, constructing elaborate rules for domesticating disobedience of an unruly society and putting a hazardous polity in order. So what should have been a transformative moment in 1947 with independence and the enactment of the constitution ushering universal adult franchise is too frequently subverted by the fetishization of electoral democracy, as well as the double speak that accompanies it. Given the undeniable public appeal, and not just the public appeal, but the real appeal of the term, critics are held hostages to democracy. While many, including the Maoists, have called for true democracy or a people's democracy, um, the impossibility of bringing it through any kind of Maoist practice, which in itself is deeply flawed and undemocratic, as well as the impossibility of bringing it in through electoral means and the criminalization of any alternative mechanisms, not just armed struggle, but a whole range of other kinds of mechanisms for introducing self-governance, lead to the aporias of democracy, a point of no escape, no return, a moment when democratic procedures and aspirations are complicit in subverting democratic outcomes, but yet there is no alternative to fighting for some kind of democracy to come um, in as much as one fights. Thank you.